Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Van Dorn. I'm with the Chamber of Commerce and want to welcome you to our June Economic Vitality Committee. Thank you all for waking up this morning and this beautiful day before it gets uh, 105 or whatever it's supposed to be today. So thank you for being with us. Um, I'd like to um, ask for uh, Will to uh, start our Pledge of Allegiance. Will? Great, good morning, everybody. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America. And, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and, and justice for all. for all. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Great job. And thank you for the flag. <laughs> that was awesome. So um, I'd, I'd like to introduce some new folks that are joining us before we do the roll call. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Vice Mayor Julie Testa. Thank you for joining us, uh, filling in for Jack. Good to have you with us. Uh, we also have Tiffany Cadret uh, in her new role with the fair. So Tiffany, welcome. And I'm not sure if Zach has joined us yet. Uh, I don't see him yet. I don't see him. Okay. All right. So we'll do that later. So why don't we do the roll call, Lisa, please. Okay. Please say aye if you're here. Brian Wilson. Aye. Daniel Watson. Aye. Ellen Penske. Aye. Harsh Goel. Aye. Jeff Chen. Vice Mayor Julie Testa. Aye. Kelly Mikashi. Tiffany Cadret. Aye. Michael Lee. Aye. Rena Gupta. Aye. Roderick O'Brien. Aye. Sharif Madavi. Aye. Steve Baker. Aye. Steve McCoy Thompson. Aye. Steve Van Dorn. Here. Sylvia Tian. Did Zach join us? No. He said, it looks like Zach, might, Zach uh, chatted and said he's here, so he might just be on audio. Okay. So if you want to call him, he can. Okay. Or, Is that or Grant? He, he, might, he may be a, an attendee, I think. Uh, you know, he's not a panelist. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Oh, there you oh, go. Oh, yeah. We'll, you're right. We'll promote him. Thanks, Steve. Just did it. You're welcome. Okay. Tracy Farhad. Here. Will Dorlick. Aye. And then Zach, are you in the room? There he is. I see him. There he is. I am Zach here. Is in the you. house. Gotcha. Okay. We have a quorum. Okay. So welcome, Zach. Uh, Zach uh, Grant is the new PDA executive director. Welcome to our Economic Vitality Committee meeting. Zach, glad you're here. Okay. Let's uh, move through the agenda. We have lots of great things to talk about today. Are there any amendments to our agenda that was sent out? No amendments. No amendments. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, we have the consent calendar, which uh, is uh, in essence the approval of the meeting minutes of May 20th, 2021. Um, any, uh, can I get approval for the minutes? Any questions, any changes, Mr. Baker, anything in that area? I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes as written. Second. And we get Will as a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Awesome. Next item is public comment. Uh, do we have anyone from the public that would like to speak to our committee this morning? We do not have any comments, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Next, we have uh, public hearings and other matters. Um, and uh, again, it's a pleasure to have Vice Mayor Julie Testa with us this morning. She's gonna give us an update on the city council uh, liaison report. And uh, Julie, it's all yours. Hey, great. Well, hey, it's, well, it's great to be here again. It's been a, a while um, as the committee paused through pandemic and um, I um, had been active on the committee for, um, a, at least a year prior to that. So it's really nice to be here this morning, bright and early. Who needs sleep? Um, 
And uh, so, yeah, we've had some, our last city council meeting, we approved our, um, our budget, our operating budget, and we actually are in, not surprising for um, the fiscal strength of Pleasanton, we're in, in good shape. We had some losses, but we've had um, a lot of um, recovery and we've received a lot of funds from the um, state and federal um, care funding to um, uh, backfill the losses and expenses of the pandemic. So currently our operating budget is balanced, yay. General fund reserves will be 31 million and um, we, um, the overall operating budget is projected to be 195.1 million for 21-22. Overall, um, we, as usual, look pretty good. We also had a um, couple of really good projects on our agenda. The, um, this group would be really interested in the exciting presentation from uh, 10X Genomics, um, which was approved unanimously. It's a, of course, a, um, a biotech company that has been in Pleasanton for quite some time, um, started in Pleasanton. It's um, grown and expanded to the new site over by the Stone Ridge Mall, taking over the old, um, J.C. Penney's site, and um, I'm sure everyone has seen that the old um, site has been raised and it stands ready to develop this exciting new project that will be a um, research and development office and laboratory complex starting, it'll be phased in starting with the first um, Part of the project, which will be a three story building, um, very exciting and contemporary, and it will um, grow in phases. So we're very excited about that. We also approved um, the exploration and um, moving forward of a very complex project to um, mitigate our PFOS in our water. Um, PFOS, I'm sure everyone is aware, is a harmful um, substance that we didn't know to look for until 2019. And we've been, um, once we were aware of the con very concerning levels in our water sources, as well as own sevens, as well as many, many um, municipal sources across the state and in fact, across the nation. But this project is um, absolutely necessary, but it's going to be very expensive. And so we will be having more discussion, but at this point we've approved going forward on some plans. It's gonna be very involved in, um, rehabbing our existing wells and there will be some changes to some of the wells and um, at a, a cost right now that's projected at, I think it was $46 million, but um, we're very concerned. We don't want that to reflect in um, it all being um, burdened by our rate payers. We do believe that there will be significant federal and state grant funds available to offset some of the costs, as well as we're looking at other funding sources. So um, that will be a uh, two to four year project, best case being completed in 2024. So um, there's a lot to work on on that one. And um, I think those are the, hi the highlights. Um, so back to you, Steve. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Testa. Appreciate that. Um, exciting news with 10X Genomics, uh, very appropriate for our meeting today. So I uh, look forward to uh, that project uh, kicking off here. 
So um, any questions for council member test, uh, Testa, Vice Mayor Testa? No? Okay, great, thank you. Let's move along to uh, some, some a really exciting subject matter discussion regarding expanding Pleasanton's life sciences sector. Uh, and Pamela is going to kick this off. Good morning, Pamela, and thank you. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here, and nice to see you as we head into a reopened summer. So, a uh, little round of applause for all of you guys for getting through what has been just sort of this unprecedented year, but uh, happy to be talking with you this morning. And I'm just gonna do the framing because I think we have some uh, really great conversation to have with you this morning about the expansion of Pleasanton's life sciences sectors. And as Vice Mayor Testa already showed you, um, what a great opportunity to, to step off this conversation with exciting news about 10X Genomics. Um, if you don't know about their project or you want more detail, uh, the agenda report from Tuesday night's meeting is certainly available and has some of the renderings in it. And then uh, if you really want to hear a little bit more in detail, Serge Saxonov, their CEO, actually addressed the council and made some comments um, about why he chose the city of Pleasanton, which are really great to hear and something that we want to build and capitalize on. You know, one of the phrases that Serge offered or his uh, design team was they think about this new complex as a science village park, which were three words I might not ever have put together. Um, but I think it's really compelling and we might be able to, uh, to step off on that at some point too, as we continue to promote and talk about life sciences in Pleasanton. But what I would love uh, for the EVC to do today is really um, re re-inform yourselves or reset yourselves on where we are relative to thinking about and talking about life sciences in Pleasanton, what's happening in our market, right? That was our intent when we shared those articles with you to let you know that the market is bringing a lot of these really great, exciting companies to Pleasanton. And that's not without uh, effort on the part of groups like iGate or Daybreak Labs, which we'll hear from in a little bit, and the work of our commercial brokers across the city, including Brian Wilson, Daniel Watson, and a whole host of others that are focused on uh, their interest in bringing life sciences to Pleasanton as our partners and what we do. And then certainly the companies themselves, um, represented by one of our panelists, Andy Blighty, um, who's going to talk to us as a practitioner. And what I hope uh, we come away with today is the idea that uh, you know life sciences is a growing and really exciting uh, potential um, economic development, not even a potential, sorry, that's, it is an exciting economic development strategy for us here in the city of Pleasanton. Um, it does a lot of things. It provides uh, companies that are stable, that attract employees, um, that we have the, this really great match of skill sets for and that benefit our residential population, right, in terms of letting them work locally here. And many of these life sciences companies return sales tax and other revenues to the city. So again, just a lot of um, really solid reasons why we would want to lean in and support that. And not the least of which is we have commercial inventory that allows us to um, create successful homes for these businesses. And so what today's conversation will be is this um, panel that talks to you about how uh, companies think about life sciences from Andy's perspective. As I mentioned, Andy is um, a life sciences practitioner. He currently works for, um, Andy, it's Roche, right? Where you're currently located right now? No, I'm out of Roche now. I've been out awesome. of Roche. Uh, I'll let you. I'll let you give us your uh, your super quick bio when we talk. I don't want to yeah. take that away from you and get anything else wrong. So Andy's here to talk about from the practitioner standpoint and how companies think about this and what his expertise as somebody who works in life sciences brings to the table and how that might inform the work that we do. Uh, Brandon Cardwell, as I mentioned, he's the executive director of iGate and Daybreak Labs, who the city of Pleasanton has had a long a partnership with as um, we do as uh, we do collectively with the other Tri Valley cities and really working to create this ecosystem 
um, that supports life sciences, but also really focuses on supporting the entrepreneurial or the startup uh, sector here. Um, particularly that goes back to Vice Mayor Testa's comments about 10X, about how they started here and were able to grow here and stay here, right? So the, the attracting companies like uh, 10X is important, but it only works if they're able to, <laughs> to start here and stay here too. So this whole life life cycle of companies. And so Brandon will talk more about that and some exciting uh, projects that he's working on. And then uh, Brian has been talking to me and to Lisa and works really closely with Brandon about what we can do maybe from a commercial perspective or maybe some, from, from some policy perspectives at the city, right? Or process perspectives that help um, pave the way for life sciences to come and know that Pleasanton's a place where they want to locate. And so this is, um, this is really great. So um, we're, I'm gonna stop there and talk. And I, I also wanna say that Dan Watson, one of our other EBC members, even though he's not on the plant panel, uh, we did tell Dan ahead of time that we certainly would appreciate his expertise and jumping in here where we start to talk about commercial real estate as well. And I think all of you have something to bring to the table um, when we have this conversation in terms of your networks and what you know and who you know and how you think about this. And with that, I am gonna ask uh, Andy maybe to kick us off and then Brandon and then Brian, each of them have about hmm, five to 10 minutes of comments that they wanna make, but really at the end of the day, we wanna set the stage and then have a conversation with the EBC. So how's that sound, you guys? Well, awesome. Pamela, Listen. yeah, just, uh, I think it's important too that we remember that uh, we're looking at these three questions, right? Uh, that's in the agenda. Um, yeah. Thank so you, Steve. Yeah. There's, thank you, Steve. Because we could talk about life sciences for the next, you know, eight hours, eight days, eight months, right? And um, what we tried to do was set a, a, just a handful of questions for you all to think about as you're going through this topic. And it's really, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages that Pleasanton has? that are compared to other cities and Bay Area locations? And is there a role for the city to play in capitalizing on those advantages or addressing the disadvantages? Um, how might our policies or processes be amended or enhanced to allow for that? And what are the key next steps to support this? So um, I alluded to some of those. Uh, I know our panelists will do that as well. And so thank you, Steve, for pointing that out to help frame the whole rest of the conversation. And with that, Andy, I am going to let you go and toss it over to you. Thanks for being here this morning. All right. Thank you for in inviting me to this. Uh, this has been kind of like a little dream of mine. Um, uh, as I go through this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I basically did my graduate work at uh, Tufts Med and my immunology at Harvard under Baruch Benassarraf, who won the Nobel Prize in 1980. And a lot of my development as a development scientist in biotech uh, has gone through Becca Dickinson and the Monoclonal Center, which uh, is a huge thing, and through uh, Applied Biosystems, which is famous for TACMAN technology. And that technology is mRNA, which is associated with all of the uh, uh, vaccination. Um, I finished my career with uh, Roche uh, in corporate America um, under molecular biology here in Pleasanton and in Santa Clara. I have direct contact to the CEO of Roche, who was my boss, Severin Schwann. Um, so I have many contacts, uh, Hanka Pillar, uh, the, the work that was done during the Human Genome Project and things of that. So that's my background um, from that. I've been a resident of Pleasanton since 1997. And so brought the kids up here, schooling and everything else and have done well here in Pleasanton. Next slide. So I am the CEO of a small startup called Salsa's Biotech. We're doing digital pathology, radiology, um, dental. Um, this uh, company actually uh, is doing 8K uh, analysis and reprocessing. So uh, this is gonna be used uh, for uh, 
um, uh, diagnostic in the future, and it's going to be used in artificial intelligence and deep learning. And one of my uh, famous sayings is ask immunological questions, give molecular answers. Next slide. So my experience in Pleasanton, I, I actually worked with Bob Ragusa to establish the applied biosystem, which was taken over and now is Thermo Fisher on the Sunol property in 1998. And all of my, um, uh, I was the team lead for 200 people that uh, led to the technology and all the jobs that are there. And basically we did the human genome project. Um, then I moved to molecular uh, systems where I did a lot of training, high-end uh, um, projects for uh, Daniel O'Day, who is now at Gilead. And we did virology, blood screening, the PCR technology. We uh, established that digital pathology with deep learning and software. I have recently left uh, Roche um, in December. Um, I've had uh, talks with Ben Hansen and uh, uh, one of my former bosses is the vice president there, Paul Weil, Wyatt at 10X Genomics. I know the Swartzes from BioRad for digital PCR and a lot of the guys that were at 10X did di digital PCR. I was on the committee for um, Prop 14 to pass. I had been on the original committee with Robert Klein. Uh, my passion is really stem cells. And I'd like to see a stem cell company come to uh, Pleasanton. Next, next slide. So our mission I would see is branding Pleasanton as a biotech hub, which we are now. We have the two biggest molecular biology companies in the world are right here. They were the companies that did all the PCR for the COVID uh, assays. Uh, Roche Molecular, which uh, their manufacturing is in Branchburg and the manufacturing for Thermo Fisher, which originally was applied biosystems right here is right off of the snow. It's an unbelievable situation. So I believe that we need to uh, include the support for the companies that are here. The third one is kind of a thing that I've talked with Julie Tesla and with uh, Mayor Car Brown about uh, um, doing a bio incubator that facilitates and assists in growth of the next generation of uh, biopharmas, life sciences, and medical devices in Pleasanton. Yeah. We had a long time ago with Paul Wyatt, who is now at 10X, uh, an education that was uh, PCR based in the late 90s. And we could get back to the education, but I believe we have to educate the, the community that we have this unique situation and you can see the growth in 10X of uh, life sciences here. Um, I, I helped start one, I've, I've started at least four companies and like I said, I have uh, associations. Next, next slide, please. So why expand biotech in um, Pleasanton? To stimulate our success, uh, we will be in Pleasanton to foster creative exchanges, uh, uh, active cl collaborations. So I'd like to see more of this going on as a formality and not so much as ad hoc. We should foster, uh, uh, provide uh, any services uh, we can to improve the performance. Uh, facilities is, uh, as they're going to talk about for mentoring, organizing training interactions with uh, prospective investors or people coming in or, you know, dealing with Surge or Ben Hansen uh, over at 10X run uh, seminars and workshops to expand the knowledge 
uh, new skill sets, you know, that's part of an incubator of being able to do that. So I see that the city could uh, provide with the, the facilities, provide that type of thing, or the high schools here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, program objectives to uh, participate, uh, skill development, professional communications and inter inner uh, personal relations, public relations. That, that's a huge thing. The city could do that. Uh, skill gap closures, being able to um, give uh, lectures or, or, or courses and, and doing that. Community enhancements is another thing the city could do. And uh, participation of uh, newer existing members of our science community. You know, bringing someone in here that just got a job uh, at one of these big facilities and, you know, making them comfortable. I had a boss that came from Germany and I did a lot of that work, you know, telling them where to go to restaurants, uh, getting the kids set up in the schools, uh, you know, knowing what's going on in California. And the other part of this is to expand it out to CIRM, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, which is the stem cell um, organization. They just got a, the bond passed for $5.5 billion. We, we could get involved with that. For interest, interest members, the support provided for an incubator, you know, that's what we're talking about, a bio incubator. There are two bio incubators in the Bay Area, one in San Jose and one in Emeryville. And Emeryville sometimes is looked upon as, you know, the bio hub. Uh, but South uh, San Francisco, where Genentech is, is looked upon as a biohub. So th those are the things that I think we can expand in the city. I think that's the last slide. Awesome. You know, thanks, Andy. I have so many um, thoughts and ideas rattling around in my head. Um, but I think if we could, as a matter of process, go ahead and hear from Brandon and then Brian as well, that'll give you all uh, a whole picture of what's happening and that'll uh, dovetail nicely together. And then we can uh, see what the panelists conversation we want to have with them as members and they might have some conversation with each other's as well. So Brandon, I'll go ahead and ask you to jump in if you would and we'll go from there. There we go. Can you all see my iGate slide up? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Um, this is great. I think this is the second or third time I've been with this committee over the years, but a lot of folks I, I don't know yet. So looking forward to the conversation. So I'm the executive director of the iGate Innovation Hub, which is a 10-year-old nonprofit organization co-founded by the two national labs in the city of Livermore originally, um, but for the past many years has enjoyed a partnership with the other Tri-Valley cities, uh, with the exception of San Ramon. And I just want to say Pam Ott has been an exceptional partner uh, to me and the city of Pleasanton has to iGate for, uh, for all of our history. So we appreciate that support uh, as always. So the quick and dirty on our organization, we primarily do two things. Um, so we run an incubator called Daybreak Labs uh, and have been running incubators for almost exactly 10 years. We opened our first one in June 30th of 2011. Um, various forms of, of that incubator, and I can walk through some of the learnings on how we have supported companies over the years. But really since 2018, we've been primarily focused on life sciences and deep tech companies. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of kind of where we are in our current stage and how we're changing our model to better support those companies. The other thing that we do, um, which we've recently rolled up a collection of different activities into what we are now calling Startup tri -Valley. Um, so we were running a life sciences focused uh, event series called the Next Tech Speaker Series. We've done two life sciences summits uh, at Viva Systems in Pleasanton, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, and so we've now expanded that to include a host of other uh, content marketing, branding and ecosystem development activities that are focused on building this thriving startup community here in the region. So for Daybreak, um, we've supported 35 companies um, throughout our history, uh, a host of, of other individual innovators, but from a company standpoint, about 35, they've raised a little over $150 million in venture capital, 
directly created uh, over 235 jobs. We don't include common economic multiplier effects in our jobs, um, which are usually anywhere from four to seven uh, X on the job multipliers, depending on which literature you like to, to reference in terms of how many indirect jobs are created for every true tech job that gets created. So you can do whatever math you like on those numbers. Um, our most prominent alumni is, uh, is AI over in Dublin. Some of you may be familiar with, uh, they went public via SPAC at a $2 billion valuation a couple of months ago. Um, they've got 55,000 square feet over uh, next to Trinet in Dublin. They were in Pleasanton for a time after they spun out from our incubator. Um, Safe Traces is another company some of you may be familiar with, which was a Lawrence Livermore spin out um, that now operates in Pleasanton. And they do, uh, they have a host of technologies uh, focused primarily on food traceability and also uh, indoor air quality monitoring, which became really important during, during COVID-19. <laughs> Um, our current status for the incubator is we are in the process working with Brian Wilson actually in securing a new facility um, that will really be dedicated exclusively to these life sciences and deep tech companies. Um, so we'll be acquiring some lab space, building out some lab space. We'll offer BSL-1 and BSL-2 ready lab space. Um, and the facility piece is really important, obviously, for, for many of the reasons that Andy just mentioned. Um, but the part that we've really seen as lacking is the a really consistent and systematic relationship to the investment community. So when we decided we wanted to really focus in on life sciences and deep tech companies, because we think we have some competitive advantages as an organization and as a region in those sectors, uh, we reached out to Tri-Valley Ventures. Um, which some of you may know, they've been around since 2017, formally as a venture fund, but Greg Kitchen operated Innovate Pleasanton prior to that. And he actually made the first investments in our portfolio companies back in 2013. So I've been working with Hitch for the last seven or eight years. And uh, so I approached him and said, look, we can provide this facility space because we have funding partnerships with our local cities and national labs. We can provide life science facility space at no cost uh, to a small number of companies. We can't do that on a large scale, um, but we can on a small scale offer this no cost facility space. So if we can provide some runway to these companies in terms of the facilities, and you provided some capital to these companies, I think we can really substantially lower the barriers to entry to getting a lot more life sciences and deep tech companies operating here in the region. I actually think we can pull companies from all over the Bay Area, possibly all over the country with a model like this. So we're gonna launch a, a program as soon as we get our new facility up and running where Tri-Valley Ventures will provide one to $200,000 in capital to startups. We'll provide up to 12 months of runway on an application basis. Tri-Valley Ventures will provide the mentoring and company building support, and we'll provide all the facility components and the services and amenities that the companies need from the very early stages of the kind of one to two founder stage growing up into seed round, series A and beyond. Uh, for Startup Tri-Valley, our goal here is to have a, a branding and ecosystem support initiative that makes the Tri-Valley the go-to destination for science-based startups. Um, we think the lower cost of operating a business here, the access to the innovation talent pool in the Bay Area and the fabrication and design and um, machining and, and other types of more vocational talent pool that is over the hill in the Central Valley. We are at the convergence of those two labor sheds. And that's a really important thing for our region. And I think is one of the, um, those advantages we can capitalize on is we're less expensive to operate than the Emeryville's and South San Francisco's that Andy mentioned. We have more physical footprint in terms of industrial space for these companies like 10X Genomics and Unchained Labs and Purigen and others who are making physical products that have biological innovation inside. Um, and you can, as I had this conversation with Tim Harkness from Unchained Labs a couple of years ago said, being in Pleasanton, I can hire a, a world leading PhD for $250,000 a year from anywhere in the Bay Area and they're coming reverse commute. And I can hire an assembler at $19 an hour and give them a shorter commute from Tracy, Manteca, wherever they're coming from. So I think that's a really important uh, advantage that we can capitalize on as a region. And we wanna make sure that those science-based startups who are gonna be doing that kind of work uh, know that the Tri-Valley is a really good option for them. So uh, we've recently launched a new web branding platform called StartupTriValley.org. Uh, we are featuring a news section there, which you can see some of on the left, uh, that great article that I'm sure all of you saw about Pleasanton creating an ecosystem for biotechs. Uh, Monarch Tractor is a Livermore-based company that was just featured on CNN. 
for an electric autonomous tractor. Um, Zeiss, obviously opening their big facility over in Dublin. There's an enormous amount of good news coming out of the Tri-Valley that often gets overshadowed by our proximity to the Bay Area. So somebody needs to be amplifying those messages and making sure that our own residents and community members know about it, but also that those who are being priced out of the, the, the Bay Area or otherwise could build their company here and get some advantage and know that we're interested in that and welcoming them and want to help them. So we also, as I mentioned, we put on the Next Tech Speaker Series, which has featured CEOs like Serge Saxonoff from 10X, Tim Harkness from Unchained Labs, um, Hemi Parthasarthi from Breakout Labs, uh, Sandstone Diagnostics, another Pleasanton company that spun out from Sandia, um, <clears throat> Greg Summer and Ulrich Schaff, their co-founders. And our goal with that speaker series is really to bring successful CEOs who have built companies here in the region to help share their stories of how to build good companies with the next generation of aspiring entrepreneurs. And then we've put on uh, 2020 through a wrench in our, in our uh, life science summit, but in 2018 and 2019, we threw two very successful uh, regional life sciences summits featuring speakers from Neotract and Zeltic Aesthetics and, and a whole host of local companies. Um, Tim Harkness spoke there with us again as well, really focused on sharing the story of the regional bioeconomy, um, which really Pleasanton is at the heart of, which is part of the reason why we do it in Pleasanton. And Viva has been a great partner to us, but Pleasanton already has an extraordinary reputation as an innovation center within the Tri-Valley. And we wanna make sure that our whole region is getting that same kind of amplification and brand awareness and capturing that mind share across the entire Bay Area. So that's about as fast as I could do that. I don't know how I was on time, Pam, but uh, uh, happy to go into any element of that in more detail um, for those who would like to know, but I will stop there. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. I appreciate it. Good stuff. And you can see how all these pieces are starting to interweave with each other. Uh, Brian, you want to go ahead and jump in and then we'll uh, we'll go through that and then we'll just start a conversation. Great. Sounds good. Um, thanks a lot, Pam. And, and, and well done, um, Andy and Brandon. Great point. Thank you so much. Um, Real quick, everyone, Brian Wilson here, fellow EBC member. Um, I'm a commercial real estate advisor with Cushman and Wakefield. Um, in particular, I focus on um, life science uh, companies. Um, what we're gonna do here is we're first gonna kind of take a look, a look at the, uh, just a snapshot of the entire Tri-Valley, the, the real estate sort of portfolio or landscape there, and uh, take a look at some of the other sort of life sciences hubs in the Bay Area, um, as some of my other panelists mentioned, um, sort of Emeryville, Inner East Bay Area, and South San Francisco Peninsula area as well. Um, and then dive a little bit more into the Tri-Valley life sciences um, <clears throat> uh, uh, ecosystem. So, so just at 30,000 feet, um, the Tri-Valley is made up of 30 million square feet of both office and R&D, R&D flex space. Um, of that, um, about 2.7 million square feet is lab or controlled environment rooms, whether it's lab or clean room. Um, <clears throat> but right now, the Tri-Valley is sitting about, with respect to lab space, is sitting at about 8% vacancy, which is a stark contrast to um, office and R&D uh, vacancy, which is sitting at about 14 to 15% vacancy. So, and as we've seen um, over, you know, the pandemic, I mean, office has just taken um, a significant hit um, in, in vacancy and lease velocity, whereas, you know, life sciences has been booming over this time period. So um, with respect to rents, um, we are, as in the Tri-Valley, uh, we are significantly less expensive. Um, than the other Bay Area. So for lab space in particular, um, we're looking at between a dollar to $2.40 a foot triple net. Um, again, that's in stark contrast to the South San Francisco Peninsula area, which is um, going for about five to $7 um, triple net uh, versus uh, Emeryville, which is the Emery Emeryville Inner East Bay which is going between $3 and five cents um, a foot triple net. Um, additionally, those markets are just much larger for lab inventory. So for the sort of South San Francisco um, Peninsula market, they have about 20 million square feet of lab versus our 2.7 million square feet. 
and the Inner East Bay, um, Emeryville market, they have about 8 million square feet of lab. Um, and their vacancies are, are much, um, their vacancy rate is much less than ours. So South San Francisco is up around four to 5% and the Emeryville market is around similarly around um, um, five to 6%. So, so just to give you uh, an idea of recent transactions, um, uh, so as uh, Vice Mayor Testa mentioned, obviously 10X is, uh, there's a lot of buzz going on. So around 10X and what they're doing. Um, so they just recently acquired um, Pleasant Plaza, which is 14 acres of land and improved retail. Um, and they're going to, they just got it recently entitled um, to build out uh, 381,000 square feet of office R&D and lab, um, which is very exciting. Um, and they also just recently um, leased out another entire building at Pleasanton Commons. They currently occupy one of those buildings that you see from the freeway, I'm sure all of you can see it. So that's 150,000 square feet. They just recently leased out um, another um, 150,000 square feet, um, another one of those buildings. Um, some other um, buzzworthy news and transactions in the Tri Valley as well. So um, as was mentioned too, Zeiss um, purchased 11 acres out in Dublin and they got it entitled to build, I think 433,000 square feet, multiple buildings. They just finished phase one, I think in, in March or April of this year. So that half of it, so it's about 200,000, 210,000 square feet. Um, <clears throat> so some other news too is um, Via Carta out of Richmond, um, they just leased out 37,000 square feet uh, of Hop Yard Road here in Pleasanton. Um, so that's kind of exciting to see that um, migration from the Inner East Bay to the Tri Valley Pleasanton area. Um, so we also had um, so Teleflex leased out um, 76,000 square feet, an entire R&D building in Pleasanton um, about a year and a half ago. And also BioRad purchased um, uh, two sister buildings um, totaling about 100,000 square feet um, in Pleasanton. And, and a lot of this is happening. So th these are some of the exciting transactions that are happening. Um, so, and we get, we have a good blend of both sort of well or long standing, long established companies such as Roche and Abbott. Um, but um, we also have the younger companies, younger life sciences companies growing and billowing here, like you know, the 10X Genomics and, and Untamed Labs um, and Purigen Biosystems. Um, so um, it's exciting times. So one, one, of the, one of the issues I think that we have, so we do have less expensive real estate, I mean, which is great, especially for the younger life sciences companies, but the issue that we have, especially for expansion and migration into our market, or even growth, frankly, is just the dearth of lab that we have here. I mean, it is expensive to build out lab. And uh, as maybe even Dan can talk about too, because Dan represents the landlords around here, is it, it's incredibly expensive to build out lab and it's becoming more and more costly to do so. Construction costs have skyrocketed over the past year um, just due to you know, an increase in commodities and shipping. Um, deliveries um, and just, just labor as well has gone up. So um, it's becoming harder and harder to do that. So, and what, you know, life science companies like is they like to be able to scale. So they like and, and scale easily. So they go from incubation, you know, at Daybreak Labs, to their first stop, which is, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 square feet, um, you know, and their next sort of um, progression from there is, you know, five to 10,000 square feet, and maybe they start commercializing. And if we're talking about a medical device company, they also need production facilities too. So they're growing to, you know, 10 to 20,000 square feet, and then so forth and so on. The problem is we don't have a lot of blocks, available blocks of lab or those kind of life science facilities. So it just makes it difficult, one, to migrate, and then two, to scale in our market in a way to to um, address that situation is just we need more lab, but it's tough right now because what we're doing is we have to convert existing infrastructure, existing buildings to lab, which was very popular, excuse me, um, before the pandemic, but now with construction costs, again, just going way up, it makes it more difficult to do so. 
Um, mind you, they are doing that in these other markets in South San Francisco, uh, in the, the Emeryville area, they're doing a lot of these conversions or even ground up, frankly. But the blessing and the curse of having less expensive real estate is that it doesn't, it makes it more difficult for develop potential for developers to build these facilities out. So, um, so that, that makes it, that makes it difficult to do so. So it's almost, I mean, the way to remedy that is that, you know, we either have cheaper um, value of unimproved land, which, which isn't going to happen folks, or we increase the, the rental rate um, of these life science facilities. Um, and that will help make that pencil. So, um, that, but that's kind of it. Um, happy to ask any, uh, answer any questions you all have, and maybe we just kind of open it up for the group or whatever you want to do. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. So, and Brandon and Andy as well, uh, you know, really good perspectives, right. That help give us a sense of what that whole, um, what the whole, um, market might look like in Pleasanton and, Certainly we've talked about some of the successes we've had recently, but the thrust of this conversation is really, how do we, how do we continue to build on that? And what do we, you know, in, in really positive ways, you know, is it messaging, is it promotion? We've talked about some of that. And how do we surmount some of what we think our challenges or any hindrances might be, right? Whether it's um, kind of availability of space and the kinds of space they want, or processes or policies. And those are really the core of the questions that we asked. So I'm going to toss it out and see if anybody has any initial questions, either from the panel or from um, the EVC, and see if we can get something of a conversation going here, thinking about and, and really guiding you back to those questions we asked. What can we capitalize on and what do we need to maybe tackle a little bit? Um, I look at it through the city's lens, right? What is the city's role in this and where can we have have influence and help shape that market, but certainly um, we have partners here at the table and some of you all with your net marks might have some other opportunities to, to offer input as well. So Pam. Sorry, uh, Sharif, I'm sorry, Andy, Sharif has his hand up there and um, but we can go to you first, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, first of all, uh, great presentations by all three of you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Brandon, great to see you again. And I have a two-part question for you. Um, you know, you've done such a great job in your role and what you've got going with um, the, the several organizations. How do we not step on what you've done? You know, if you had a magic wand and you could point it at the city of Pleasant and said, here's what I need for the next step in the evolution of this ecosystem, what role would we play in that? As opposed to saying, oh, let's just set up a, an incubator and accelerator. You've done that. So what do we do to complement you? Yeah, well, I, I think um, it's certainly not zero sum. And I think there's a lot of room for specialization even within the startup support space, right? So we're gonna set up the incubator focused on life sciences and deep tech. Um, most of the companies that we're seeing come into our space or inquire about coming into our space when it's finished are in the diagnostic devices, life science tools, and then various other kinds of non-life sciences, deep tech spaces like materials or energy and things like that. So um, I don't know, you know if the city of Pleasanton wanted to pursue setting up its own incubator, um, you know, I, I'd be happy to engage in that conversation of, of what that could look like. I think one of the things, and, and Brian alluded to this, that is a consistent challenge is the what happens post incubation. Do we have landlords? Do we have zoning? Do we have you know, all of the sort of um, critical path components for companies as they are trying to spin out um, from an incubator setting to be able to seamlessly transition into existing spaces that might need retrofits? And then how do we get more landlords involved in the conversation where they can be educated about the value of life science facility investments and potentially bring new landlords and developers to the table? Um, you know, maybe in Alexandria or Biomed Realty is, is a bit of a reach given their sort of peninsula and South San Francisco focus, but Awareham Development certainly feels like an interesting target to bring in and think about doing some purpose-built turnkey lab space. So I think it really is all of our responsibility to look at the whole life cycle of, uh, of company development and recognize that we work at very early stages. We're at like the you know, two person co-founder type of stage. 
And a lot of the companies who will spin out from our incubator and have spun out from our incubator have never done a facility transaction before. They don't know how to do space planning. They need a couple of thousand square feet, but then immediately post series A, we'll need 15, 20,000 square feet. And how do we make sure that they have what they need to be able to seamlessly scale and stay here in the region and not get lured into areas that have really rich ecosystems of expertise like Emeryville, South San Francisco. Um, as a side note, I don't worry too much about that because if you look at most of the companies that have started and scaled here effectively, the, the founders are here. Um, I think Serge lives in Oakland um, from 10X, but I think his other founding team is in this area. And um, if, you, if you know the story of 10X and some of the other companies around here, they all spun out from Quantalife after Quantalife's acquisition by BioRad and Quantalife was a Lawrence Livermore spin out. So there's this whole sort of lineage and family tree phenomenon that goes on. Um, but I think we really need to focus on these local founders, building local companies and make sure they have absolutely no reason to leave. Great, Th thank you. Um, uh, Andy, did you have a comment before I yeah. uh, jump to the other hands that are raised? <clears throat> my, my main comment is uh, Brandy uh, right now for the city and for the organization. Uh, Brandon has quite an organization going for startups and right like that. We need to take advantage of that. But Brand, uh, the Tri-Valley area as a hub for, uh, um, for biotech. Um, no, no one really knows that. Um, and you, you need to get the word out to the rest of the world that you have the two biggest molecular biology. And, uh, and Brandon did talk about Quantify and uh, BioRad and you know all, all of that came out of Applied Bio and some of it came out of Roche. So the expansion, Roche has been here in Pleasanton, I think since 1995 when they bought bought into the facility and they bought PCR from Cetus Immune. Um, and they've been making a heyday uh, with the, and then uh, uh, Applied Biosystem moved out to Thermo Fisher, a little history. Uh, they had, with Mike Hunkapiller and uh, uh, Craig Venter, they had uh, the rights to do uh, re research, and then it all merged together. And so the two PCR, TACMAN PCR, next generation sequencing, um, the big company is Illumina in Foster City and then Roche. Uh, and Roche is spending a lot of money. They have a campus now um, in Santa Clara, where they're doing the next generation sequencing, but it, it, it's really intertwined between them, Genentech, and here in Pleasanton. And Pleasanton is the most established, and uh, uh, the situation in Santa Clara is what they're doing, uh, bioinformatics and uh, digital PCR, um, artificial intelligence. So we need, we need to... Um, we need to make not only the uh, citizens of uh, Pleasanton, but the rest of the Bay Area and the rest of the world know that um, we, we have a hub here and there's a lot of stuff that just needs to be in cooperation and, and collaboration. And we need, we need to have some kind of a, a, a marketing uh, advertisement of that. That's my opinion. I've worked here in, like I said, as you guys can see in the Pleasanton area for a long time uh, with these two companies, the two major companies. Steve, I, 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 can, see a, I can see a lot of hands up, but yeah. before, um, before you jump into that, I just want to address Andy's point. So in March of this year, the IGATE Board of Directors authorized a $55,000 contract to do exactly what Andy just described. So we've hired a digital marketing agency um, that actually was founded inside of our incubator previously to specifically build out this startup <clears throat> Tri-Valley platform. We converted the site called Tri-Valley Bio that we had previously established, um, focused on the problem that Andy is addressing here. Um, and the thrust of that site will continue to be life sciences and deep tech companies. That's why we talk about startup Tri-Valley, the emphasis of that being on making the Tri-Valley the go-to destination for science-based startups and life sciences is the primary component of that. So I agree with Andy completely. That's an effort that, that needs a lot of attention. And so we're gonna give it about $55,000 worth of attention this coming year. 
Awesome. That's great to know. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, I'm going to go to Steve McCoy and then Vice Mayor Testa next. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, great presentations. Good to see you again, Brandon. I had a, also kind of a related uh, marketing and messaging question, and it is, you know, how influential was the presence of, say, Roche and Thermo Fisher, Fisher in attracting companies, you know, like 10x to place or other companies to come here? And to what degree can we leverage their presence and get them involved in the messaging to convey to other companies that this is a great place to work? Yeah, I'm sure there are all of us on the panel have have opinions on that. Um, I, I want to share something just really quickly, if I can, if I can pull this up. Um, so this is a, a little mind map that I put together that shows Lawrence Livermore here. Um, all of these people in the middle, the human beings in the middle, worked at Lawrence Livermore previously, and they spun out with Quantalife in 2008. Quantalife was acquired by BioRad in, I think, 2011 for $162 million. And the founding team of Quantalife and the early employees went on to found 10X Genomics, Purigen, and HealthTel, and then have gone on since then to found Sestina Bio. And then Kevin Ness um, is now the CEO of Inscripta after having left 10X Genomics. So this is what, in the startup space, you call a, a mafia effect, right? So you have the uh -huh. PayPal mafia, you had a... Um, the PeopleSoft Mafia, which led to Workday and to Viva Systems. And then you're seeing the Quantalife Mafia uh, following from that. And we don't know what the 10X Genomics Mafia is going to be post IPO. But this is really how regions change. So yes, you the, the presence of large research institutions like Lawrence Livermore or Thermo Fisher or, um, or Roche, they're talent magnets. And the people who work at those institutions observe some unsolved problem uh, and then go off and start their own companies and try to solve that problem. And sometimes uh, that becomes very profitable and successful, as in the case of 10X Genomics. So I think the big institutions are really important for a couple of reasons. One, they bring people to the region. Two, they provide an employment backstop that gives um, some security to people who want to try to start companies that they know that if the company doesn't work out, then there's still gonna be large employers there where they can go and get a job. Um, and of course they help with the branding uh, component that Andy's mentioned. So most of, as I mentioned, most of the, uh, the region's most successful startups really period are actually homegrown. But some of those folks came here by way of employment at the larger research institutions. Great, thank you. Um, Julie, you had a question or comment. Um, yes, thank you. I have two. Um, first one, um, I appreciated the comment of talent magnets because my first question is about our talent pool and what we can do to we hear that that is what draws um, companies is they wanna be near the talent pool. They wanna be in the center of the talent pool. So um, I, we've got our PUSD rep here. I, we've in the past had discussions of what kind of um, career technology, both our high schools and um, um, LPC are coordinating and bringing to um, to the Tri Valley, but so I, I want to know that um, I want to know what we're doing that is um, creating that pathway so that we have our homegrown talent pool that gives us that as um, one of our resources and magnets. But the other one that as um, it, city council is right now preparing to um, to address our state mandated um, regional housing needs numbers. We will be eminently zoning land for six thousand housing units. The the um, the emphasis is on um, high density and mixed use. And the reason I think, well, on one hand, we need the housing to support 
our employee pool. But my question is, is even with our discussion with um, 10X Genomics this week, um, when we're talking about rezoning for a property that is not currently zoned for research and development and, and it is near residential and we have been drawing more residential into the Hacienda Business Park, which was originally going to be our, um, our just you know exclusively business um, location. If we are doing mixed use with residential, are we limiting what kinds of uses um, we can allow in different parts of our, our city that had been envisioned to stay available for these kind of uses? Um, so um, do we need to look at, because some of the proposals informal proposals, so nothing, but there will be discussions with the campus of Thermal Fisher, whether that should be a mixed use. Does that then limit what kinds of biotech opportunities we have in our city? So are there um, aspects that we need to look at protecting, preserving, so that we can continue to grow as a biotech hub? I can take that. Yeah. I can take that. Yeah. Um, so to address your question, no, I don't think that will be a hindrance to have mixed uses um, around lab, R&D, or even production facility. In fact, I think it will continue to do so. I think that there's been a massive shift in sort of office or, you know, office for soft tech, right, where um, they like being in these TODs, these transit-oriented transit -oriented developments. They like being around live, play, work. Um, and I think that in life sciences, you used to think of it as, oh, these PhDs just want to be in a cavernous hole, right, and just kind of stay in their lane and do their work. That's not the case anymore. This, this younger breed, this younger cohort of these biologists, these scientists, these PhDs, they like more of this class A lab and they like the amenities that are surrounded around soft tech office space. So like for instance, the Genesis Towers that you see out in South San Francisco, I mean, it's multi-story class, um, class A lab, but it looks like an office tower. Um, over here, 10X Genomics was the first to really go vertical in class A lab space um, at, uh, at 6230, their, their first building right there in Pleasanton Corporate Commons. So it's very, sort of this new trend, this new norm. Um, in fact, now it's kind of become um, the benchmark, right? To have um, these mixed use developments, including um, lab and R&D. And I will say this too, it's actually important to have this mixed use where you can have office, you can have research and development, you can have lab and you can have production all within the same area or close proximity because that's important to these companies now. It's gonna be important for this region um, to do all those things in a relatively central area. And that's what makes this area so unique as I believe it was Brandon said, is that you can pull from this talent pool of these scientists, these PhDs, you know, where they're in the lab or they're doing R and D. And you can also pull the skilled labor um, from let's call it the Central Valley or along 580 um, and it's very attractive to have these, these processes, these business units all within a close proximity. So it's attractive to do that, but there also needs to be zoning in, to enable them to do that. And also for developers to do that as well, to build these, these campuses or these life sciences company and, and to quote, fill the dreams, you build it, they will come. So I think it's not only is it, is it, is it, um, not only is it, uh, I mean, it's, it's critical to do so. You said you wouldn't be a hindrance. It's not going to be a hindrance. It's going to be critical to do so. So for instance, at 10X, we don't have to go to, um, you know, city council to a vote just to get mixed use, right? Um, so just to get a PUD, I mean, that's, a, that's an arduous process. And so you talk about what the city can do. The city can do something. So whenever we need office R&D lab production in the same area and parcel, 
you know, we don't have to go and get a PUD in order to do so. so. Can I can I respond to? I, I questioned Brian whether you were addressing the pre-pandemic versus the post-pandemic um, because what you described was pre-pandemic and what we're currently seeing and is in every business journal mm -hmm. is the fleeing of what you just described, the yep. escaping from the San Francisco high density and coming to Pleasanton because we have um, living opportunities that are not in those um, concentrated um, kind of lifestyles. So I, I think that what Pleasanton offers is really more post-pandemic of what people are looking for. And what we do find that um, what you described, I think is very attractive to that pre-family, younger, um, early um, employee who is starting their career, but when they develop a little further and are also starting their family, they're looking for what Pleasanton currently offers. But I do believe that we need some of both. I do believe we have yeah. some of both. I just worry that when I was approving 10X Tuesday night, yeah. I was looking and asking questions about what kind of uh, research and development was being done in that, um, in that facility and if it was compatible with our residents that were so close. So yep. that's my concern. Okay, Thank and you. so I, I work with all these companies constantly, and that's what they want. So, yeah, I think if I could just add a, a, a brief comment there, I think it's always very challenging for a community to balance what their companies need and what the community wants for itself in terms of its built environment and the feel of the experience of being there. Um, so I'm, I'm really sympathetic to that, that point. I know that in the Tri-Valley, every city is dealing with this sort of tension between what, what they have been, what they are today, and what they might need to be to meet the needs of this, these growing tech sectors. 10X has about 150 job openings right now just in Pleasanton. And I, I've talked to some of the folks over there, and I know one of the challenges they have, um, you're right, Vice Mayor, uh, that early career pre-family employee is very much the, the San Francisco kind of lifestyle. For better or worse, a lot of our local companies also need those people to want to come and work for them. And remote may help some of that, right? Being able to do some remote work. But it's very difficult for companies to do biology remotely. And so, you know, there's, there's going to be this need to have some amount, and I certainly don't know what the right amount is, of housing and, and not just the housing, but the overall more urban experience, if you want to be able to appeal to an early career workforce that has a lot of options for what they decide where they go to work. Um, they have Emeryville, they have South San Francisco. Increasingly, they have Austin and Portland and even Boise and Raleigh-Durham and all of these places. So it, it's definitely a big challenge. And, and I don't envy the elected officials who have to try and balance these different needs. Um, but I do think that we are going to have to try to figure out how to provide some of that experience to those who, who want that or our companies are going to have a hard time recruiting. Well, and again, I think Pleasanton does have both. We have an awful lot of around the BART um, mm -hmm. and we will continue to have more. So mm -hmm. I think we, it's just a question of then still do we need to preserve other aspects of our right. lifestyle? So thank you. T tough questions, yep. Thanks, Brandon and Julie. Um, Dan, uh, you had your hand up there earlier. I, I, uh, Dan Watson, did you have a comment or question or I want to catch it before uh, we move on to the next person? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think the panel has pretty much covered everything that I was going to ask. I mean, I, I think, you know, I kind of wear the other hat that that Brian wears. I represent a lot of landlords around town and, and I've worked on some of these deals with Brian and and, and other otherwise. Um, and what Brian and Brandon stated about about the, you know, the delta in our market with rents is really made up for in the lack of tenant improvement allowances. And I think that's that's kind of the biggest challenge. I mean, I think what I can say from a capital market standpoint and Brandon, to your point about where I'm even Alexandria and Biomed, I, I think those guys actually may have some interest just because they're getting pushed out of the larger markets. I think what we can do as a panel and as a city to help that is exactly what your $55,000 uh, grant is going to going to take care of. Because, you know, as an example, 
the massive warehouse, the 400,000 foot warehouse in Hacienda that, that traded, you know, whatever that was three, four months ago, there were three or four groups that I was aware of. And Brian, you probably know more um, that were looking at that building as a life science conversion. It already has Omron. He's not life science, but is in a, you know, a solid R and D and, and uh, you know, does have some lab space in there. And, you know, the challenge in talking to the operators that I was talking to was, okay, well, show me, sh you know, show me how we can attract the talent out here, right? You have, you have Therma Fisher, you have Roche, you have TEDx, you have some big names. Um, but the challenge is, okay, well, what else is beyond that? We don't have yeah. UC Berkeley, we don't have Stanford, you know, what else are we going to do to get the draw out here? So I think those marketing materials, having something off the shelf that shows, Hey, look, do Hey, look guys, you know, gals there, there's there, this is a great place to live more. Cause I, I, I totally buy into it. And, and, you know, Brian, you made the comment of, uh, you know, if you build it, they will come. I've been, you know, I agree a hundred percent. Somebody there, we just need to find a buyer to take the leap of faith. Who's willing to put the extra hundred, $150 a square foot into the building infrastructure to get it, get it life science ready. Um, and, and I think that the marketing materials are, are critical. Thanks, so you probably just need that one time also. I mean, you need it to happen oh, once yeah. and then it will happen. The, the clustering effect within this sector, and that's what you see in the Emeryvilles and the, and the Mission Bays, is once you get that stake in the ground, the other the companies love to cluster around each other. So I totally agree. Yeah. Where, where was that group in Emeryville, right? They took Absolutely. the was a secondary yeah. market. Now it's a primary market. That's right. Totally. Great. Th thanks, Dan. Um, I'm Brandon. I'm going to move to Steve Baker next. And um, I think Rena was after Steve. So thanks, Steve. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, I think this is a great topic and uh, we're an important topic. And this has been a, a great discussion. And I'm really happy that we're having this here because I think it's important for the city. Um, I would agree with Andy's comments and some of the others about branding. I think that's really critical for us as a city. Um, you know, we've got the location, we've got a collection of existing companies, we've got the talent pool, we're close to the labs, um, we do have the commercial and R&D space. So I think we've got a lot of the key aspects uh, that are attractive. Uh, so I would wholeheartedly endorse, um, you know, the right kind of messaging uh, from the city. Um, related to that, I, I do have a couple of questions. Um, one is for Brandon in terms of looking for the new daybreak space. I hope that's primarily Pleasanton, um, but you can address that uh, when I'm through. And then the second question that I have is, uh, really around what have Emeryville and South San Francisco done to make themselves more attractive uh, to these life sciences companies? Are there programs, initiatives, um, tax breaks, infrastructure things? You know, what have they done? We shouldn't necessarily try to recreate the wheel if we can learn from their experiences, I'd like to um, mimic that as much as possible. Because um, clearly the uh, mafia effect that Brandon described is really why you start to get some of this clustering to start with. And that's gonna continue to grow organically without us necessarily having to do a lot to facilitate that. But my question is, are there things that we can do and that South San Francisco uh, and every, Emeryville have done as cities to make the environment more receptive and conducive for those particular industries and companies to be successful? And if they have, let's just mimic them as much as we can or better them um, as we understand some of those needs more specifically. So Brandon, uh, your answer, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the answer is that the city of Livermore is the funding partner that funds incubator operations. <laughs> Um, and so the, so the incubator is, is, is and has always been and, and will likely continue to be in Livermore. Um, but all of our branding and ecosystem development efforts certainly span the entire region. And 
most of our spin outs from the incubator throughout our history have landed in Pleasanton because of the commercial facilities and networks and transit and all that kind of stuff that you guys have. So have you looked at potentially um, a two facility, two city kind of a structure? Uh, we, we have not looked at that. Um, we, we did briefly uh, some time ago when the city of Dublin expressed some interest in trying to figure out whether that was an option. Uh, the reality is it's just very expensive to operate these kinds of, of facilities, especially if you don't want to operate them as real estate plays, um, but really try to support the companies. And so it's, it's a heavy lift um, to do these things. And, and so Livermore is committed to doing that, I think in large part because Livermore doesn't have a Hacienda business park and is much more challenged in attracting those kinds of companies in, into the community in Livermore. And Pleasanton has a lot of uh, more intrinsic attributes that I think uh, allow it to, to be more appealing uh, without that. So, so that's, that's, my, that's my diplomatic answer to you, Steve. <laughs> Great, thank you, Brandon. Um, I'm gonna to go to Rena next and then uh, Roderick and then Kelly. Yeah, so uh, my question is very specific to my, the area of my expertise, which is in the talent nurturing. So um, Brandon, you, and, uh, you mentioned about the Pleasanton or the Tri-Valley's cost effective and you have done some cost analysis. Have you done similar studies of what kind of talent availability is in here and what needs to be developed? Where is the gap? Uh, is, do you guys have that, that kind of, um, and the, it's very interesting to see that there's cities are putting some focus on specific, um, like a biotech and the hubs to be that, and that, that's the right approach, but what is yeah. missing and where is the gap? Any suggestion and any, um, or any studies that you have in that regard? Uh, we haven't done any, any in-depth studies. I, I will say that one, anecdotally, one of the things that we hear a lot from the kinds of companies that are in this area, they have a lot of technician level needs, um, which are often not even bachelor's degrees, uh, let alone advanced degree holders, but they're people who need to be able to do quality assurance and assembly and material handling and that kind of thing. And I think there is a, a really key role for our community college to play right. in helping to mm -hmm. fill that gap. And, and one of the things that I think we can all do collectively and that the cities can help do is create um, a community of companies that can inform what the curriculum needs to be to help some of these students who are not gonna go on and get four-year degrees go immediately to work and be really valuable to companies. If the Tri-Valley um, was, you know, one of the most prominent sources of technical uh, talent, technician level talent, feeding the biotech sector. And I think that would be a big boon. Um, and there's a model for that up in Solano County at the community college, which that community college actually confers bachelor's degrees. They, they have a certificate, associate and bachelor degree program in biomedical manufacturing. And basically Genentech designs the curriculum and the students get trained, they walk across the street to Genentech and something like 70% of the graduates of that program go to work at, uh, uh, at Genentech as soon as they finish. Yeah. So there is a model um, for that. We just haven't had participation from large anchor companies so far in designing mm -hmm. that. But I'm in regular communication with Nan Ho, who's the Dean of STEM at Las Positas, and she's very interested in that kind of a program. Yeah, and that's the reason is like nowadays we all know the, the way people learn and people get certified and the experience is very different than the traditional way. So we need to be a little bit more creative on how to create this talent pool. So love to have that discuss discussion. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've observed, certainly the pandemic has even accelerated this, is the professionalization of the talent pool in the Tri-Valley. Exactly. I grew, up, I grew up in Livermore mm -hmm. and... Livermore, um, if you look at the last census data, Livermore is the only city in the Tri-Valley that still has below 50% bachelor degree holders amongst their working professionals. It's 44%. Every mm -hmm. other city in the Tri-Valley is I think 60% and higher bachelor, a minimum bachelor degree holders in the community. And I think we're gonna continue to see that as the Bay Area, I mean, first of all, the country is becoming more professionalized and has been yeah. for some time. 
And the Tri-Valley, I think, is seeing an influx of talent from other parts of the Bay Area, which is why median home prices are going through the roof. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see where we get our technician level talent when you can no longer afford to live anywhere near the Tri-Valley if you don't, if you're not earning $150,000 a year. So that, that's a, a, a social challenge that I think we're all going to be faced with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah, let, let's uh, connect and discuss how we can figure this out. Great. Thank you. Um, we're running a short on time. This has been an awesome discussion. So I'm going to try to get the four remaining hands. Roderick, uh, please go next. Thank you. You got it. Hey, thanks uh, all for the presentations. Uh, my question is for Brian. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's really expensive to build out labs. And what I was wondering as you went through that presentation, is that something that's specific to the Tri-Valley? Is there roadblocks here? Or is that kind of something that you're seeing across the entire Bay Area uh, with this pent up demand for construction? Uh, it's, it's what we're seeing throughout the entire Bay Area. Um, the problem, and what I was trying to, trying to explain to you is the problem around here is in order for it to make sense for a landlord to do right, or even a developer, right, build something, either convert something or build ground up, is it doesn't pencil for them. Because what they look at is, right, they look at what kind of return they're going to get, okay? And so it doesn't make fiscal sense for them to build out something that's, you know, anywhere from, you know, 100 to $250 a foot in a build out when they're probably not going to get paid on that because rents are so low here compared to other areas of the Bay Area they're probably not going to get paid out on that for, you know, three to four years, you know? So then you need longer, you need longer term on these, on these, uh, these lease agreements and these younger companies, they don't want to do that. That that's, that's me. That is the biggest issue I face daily in what I do is, is trying to kind of compromise or, or bridge that gap there because these life science companies, they don't want that longer term. Right. They want they want, you know, a, a two, three year lease, maybe a five if they're more mature, more mature in their past series, series B. Right. Um, <clears throat> but these landlords, they want these longer terms because, you know, they want it to be able to make sense for them to build out um, this expensive lab facility. So it's it's just tough. But to answer your question. Um, no, it's 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 incredibly expensive to build anywhere in the Bay Area. It just doesn't make as much sense for landlords to do that here versus, you know, South San Francisco or Emeryville when they're getting, you know, four, five, even six dollars triple net compared to, you know, one to two dollars and fifty cents here. But, yeah. yep. Great. Thank you, Brian. Kelly. OK, I'll try to be super fast. I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, thank you for everyone for the presentations. My question is to all three presenters. Um, my, my biggest question is to piggyback off of Vice Mayor's a comment about um, opportunities, housing issues, as well as a uh, previous conversation with Rena and Brandon about um, opportunities for our youth. Of course, I'm going to advocate for our youth. Um, I have an interesting perspective because my husband has worked for Roche for the last 20 years, digital PCR. Um, so I, I'm I kind of watch from the sidelines, but I advocate for our youth. And so my question is, what opportunities do we have that are affordable for entry-level positions for our college grads, uh, remote or in person? And um, I'm also curtailing a point about the career and technical education opportunities, apprentice apprenticeships, internships. Um, what I've observed in the last year, my husband has worked remotely and I would argue the industry is changing. There are more opportunities for remote um, work, less travel. Um, and so that's my big question because we do wanna provide more opportunities for um, our younger generation of highly talented um, people that are living in our community. So that's my question. Uh, I'll take that um, because I worked with uh, Kelly's husband. So I know. <laughs> nice to see you, well. Andy. <laughs> yeah. So um, what happens, I wouldn't worry about the PhDs. Okay. The people you have to worry about are uh, regulatory quality assurance, people uh, that are doing development. Um, they're the ones that don't have the big $150,000 salary. So the way to do that 
is to go to Roche, go to Thermo Fisher. We can do that. I have connections and say, you know, they're unaware of what's going on. And they had transition of this from an educational point of view, but their human resource uh, divisions would be really good. And what Brandon said, you have to leverage uh, a community college. So the community college has to be part of that aspect. And, and so what you do at the community college is you do a co-op where you're, where you're starting your education, but you're also working at one of these places, okay? I, I know Ben Hansen and those, and even at Roche and even at Thermo Fisher, uh, you would able to be doing, you know, work at a small startup. And so my answer to, to you is really to develop, you know, this whole aspect of, of collaboration. And I, I think that you got to go and approach Roche and the big companies. The second thing that I'd like to say, Emeryville was started by Chiron. Okay, Chiron. There was three biotechs in the Bay Area. There was Genetech, there was Chiron, um, and, and that came from Cetus Immune. And then there was Beck and Dickinson, which is in San Jose that was started out of uh, Mountain View. Um, and that's where biotech got started through that and the, and the big universities. So once you have a focus of a, a big company that's right like that, it brings in all these smaller companies and they're all tied together. Um, as Brandon tried to tell you, I, you know, I know all the people that he, he, he basically uh, talks about, you know, and what they're doing, um, you know, so the biotech community is small. It's, it's smaller, you know, and, and, and it's tied to networking and things of that nature. So, but we, we have to, we have to be put in a process and Kelly's totally right about the young getting in, how do you get in the job? My, you know, all my um, connections of getting into a Roche were, were really connections, you know? Uh, you know, I, I knew somebody that, you know, Martina Wagner left ABI to go to Roche and I worked with the, you know, Steve Galfan and all of them on enzymes for PCR. So it becomes a connective thing. And that's, you know, so that's, but to set that up, I think that Brandon's 100% right. You have to have that, the community college. You don't need the university because you know, the university brings in all your PhD, you know, types right like that. But it's all the supporting cast and, and learning about quality assurance and learning about regulatory and learning about, you know, doing the development work is, you know, the, what biotech's all about. Great. Thank you, Andy. That's awesome. And thank you, Kelly. Uh, Tracy, you had your hand up for a while. And I uh, did you still have a question? I had so many points um, that I think this is an outstanding conversation and to go much deeper. Um, just the fact that on average, it's five times for a visitor before they become a resident and um, needing to have that branding tipping point. Um, Brandon, I'm very interested in your summits and I think uh, Visit Tri-Valley should invest in it because um, you bring them in. Uh, we show off all that, uh, that I took a picture of that chart of people who have, you know, the mafia list that um, we have a lot of opportunities here to really uh, uh, make that tipping point happen. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tracy. And I think Andy's part of the mafia too. Um, so Julie, uh, Vice Mayor Testa, did you have another question? I see your hand up. I just wanted to, um, I used to work at, uh, for a couple decades, I worked at Las Positas College. And when I was there, that was 20 years ago. And I was having those, we were having those conversations then about the importance of having career technical connection with our local industry. And then um, over the last, um, many years through different um, conversations. And even here, two years ago, where um, Pam brought together the um, community college um, and PUSD to have this conversation of connecting and creating this pathway. And 
it, it's still not really happening that, that I know of. I, I think that there were small movements, but this group, IGATE, others should be really pushing on because we've got, and Tim Sobrante is now a uh, board of trustees there. I've had many conversations with him about this and I don't understand why, because it is such a wonderful opportunity to offer these really um, significant job opportunities that again, most of our young people who go to the community college, they don't want to have to pursue the four-year education. So to give them a track that will give them the skills to step in and fill that void of talent that these companies have is just so important. And we've been talking about it for 20 years and not doing it. So I would just ask that there, everyone here that has an opportunity to further that would do so because it's just long overdue. And it, I thought it was a great conversation today. Thanks. Great. Uh, we are past our time. Um, so, um, uh, Lisa, did you want to move into the next yeah. items? Or, uh, Andy, do you have another comment? I still see your hand up. Uh, do we have a few more minutes, uh, committee, to hang in there? Or how was everybody feeling? <laughs> yes, Steve, thanks. I mean, if Andy has another comment, I certainly want to hear that. I know that we end up trying to do a lot in a little bit of time. I guess I would offer too for this committee, this is not a one and done conversation, right? This was really to sort of reset our baseline. Um, I heard a lot of um, what could potentially be some strategic activities, right, coming out of this conversation. So Lisa and I will take that back. I've already been thinking about what a roadmap like might look like relative to you know, expanding life sciences in Pleasanton. And that's something we'll continue to talk about here at the EBC. So just consider today sort of a, a, a beginning of a conversation and, and it's not, like I said, it's not one and over. So thanks you guys. Um, and Steve, I'll toss it back to you and, you know, let you decide if, if we have more time. Yeah, um, Annie, did you have another comment? Yeah, I have a, one other comment about uh, what uh, Julia is saying. Um, I think we need, we have all the connections to Las Positas, Tim Sabranti, myself, uh, Brandon. Uh, I think we should put together an ad hoc uh, committee to, to really push that. And, and, but you have to have the buy-in to the, the big uh, farmers that are here, the big biotechs that are here. So that I think that's the first step and say, are, if we put this together, are you willing to use this as a funneling? And Kelly can help and you know everybody on this committee can help with that. Uh, but uh, you know, you gotta get the buy-in. I'm pretty sure knowing Roche and knowing Thermo Fisher uh, that they would do that. I mean, Roche is very, very, uh, I know Seven Trump. I know him really well, he, he was, he was, uh, you know, ran the, a Pleasanton facility and he's community oriented beyond belief. And uh, so it, it's in their DNA, you know, it's in their DNA. And the same thing with Thermo Fisher and the same thing with 10X, same thing with BioRed. By the way, BioRed's in the area with their digital PCR habit, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Zeiss is another one. You know, you do try valid. You do it for the Tri Valley. You can't just do it for Pleasanton. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I, I, I think that based on this discussion, we have a lot of great things to follow up on, and I think that's what we need to make sure we do. Uh, as uh, Vice Mayor Tessa said, let's not let this just go. Let's stay focused on some of these great ideas. Um, and um, I think, Lisa, if you're okay, can we move the uh, economic? Uh, development updates to, to, to our next meeting or is there something specific you wanted to talk about before we close? No, we, we could just, uh, information and updates are provided in the staff report. Um, just wanted to call out quickly that the promise pass that we, um, that Tracy presented at previous meetings, um, the marketing campaign will go through the end of this month, but the promise pass will live through mid November. And then quickly we um, launched our gift Pleasanton gift card program, and we're doing really well with that. And so just encourage, um, we'll continue our marketing efforts on um, getting the word out about that. Great. Um, and then the other thing I think is we're, we've decided to take a pause in July, right, uh, Lisa, for our meeting. So we'll be 
uh, not meeting again until August. So just uh, enjoy your uh, your vacation day from Economic Vitality Committee. Um, and I think that's it. Unless anyone else has any closing comments, I think we'll close the meeting. It's um, we got 9.07. So any other comments for the good of the order? No? Good. Please, well, could I? Can I just make one com concluding comment? I just wanted to thank everyone for this this enriching conversation. I do concur with uh, Vice Mayor Testa, and also to thank all the presenters. And would definitely be very interested not just the big conglomerate companies, but the startups. Brandon loved it, loved hearing about your work, and Brian. I, I do think that there's a lot of ways that we can um, engage um, our youth and um, ultimately employment in our area. And I really appreciate this conversation to um, bring all of the circles together collaboratively to do this. So thank you. Great. And I want to thank Pamela and Lisa for pulling the speakers together. Thank you, speakers. You guys are awesome. And uh, we will see you uh, around town, hopefully face to face here real soon. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your Thanks, day. Steve. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Appreciate it. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.